Hi, this is Interviews Down Under with, with uh, Plastic EP and myself, Spencer Drake. And today we have a, a show which is the secret word is vinyl. And before we start and bring our special guest, Andrew Rossiter from the famous Orb Records, I want to make a few announcements. One is the Lou Reed Show in New York at the NYPL building. And it's an historic show that my partner Judith and I are in because we designed very famous albums, New York album, Magic and Lost album for Lou, which is being displayed in the show uh, till March 4th, 2023. And there's a lot of vinyl covers being shown at the show also. And next week, uh, there's going to be uh, the Making Vinyl event, which is all about vinyl every year. Uh, my partner, Judith, and I judge the packaging awards area, uh, founded by Brian Eckes and the famous Larry Jaffe. And that's going to be in Germany uh, this year, September 1st and September 2nd. So uh, before we get into Andrew, we're going to talk a little bit about Larry Jaffe, who founds Making Vinyl, his book, uh, record Store Day, which is all about the founding of Record Store Day and all about vinyl. And by the way, in the book is Org Records, which is a very big promoter of vinyl through the years. And now I'll introduce you to Andrew Rossiter, the owner of Org Records, which we're going to talk about now. All right. Thanks for having me aboard. Hey, Andrew, it's great to have you on. And uh, one of the things that interested me uh, was the fact that I believe in 2011, you were reissuing a lot of incredible jazz albums. And I started my career with ESP Disc, which was noted for first very famous jazz albums like Barry Sanders and Ornette Coleman. And you had uh, Miles Davis and Billie Holiday collections, things I think went on. Um, tell us about the beginning of Warg Records, what was the concept of it? And uh, I know it's a big vinyl uh, record label. That's what intrigued me about your label. Yeah, yeah. I actually came in um, after the, the, the label was already around for about a year before I came in. Um, and it was started primarily as a reissue label. So, um, you know, there was a lot of alternative rock, indie rock, punk rock stuff, um, but also a lot of jazz. And um, when I came in, the you know, the jazz started shortly thereafter. Um, we, you know, as you mentioned, you know, Miles Davis and Billie Holiday, those, those records in particular come from the Black Lime Records catalog. Um, we, we've, uh, they were long out of print um, in the US and, and elsewhere on vinyl. Um, so between that catalog and the Freedom Records catalog, uh, which is uh, kind of another label under that same banner, uh, specializing in more free jazz stuff like Albert Eiler, Cecil Taylor, uh, Marion Brown, that kind of thing. Um, so we we uh, have reissued loads and loads of records from both of those catalogs. Um, we've also done some stuff, uh, you know, from the Atlantic Jazz series like uh, John Coltrane and Orna Coleman. We did some double forty five uh, audio file editions of those mm -hmm. titles. Um, we did a bunch of CTI stuff. Um, a lot of that is now out of print because um, our licenses have expired, but uh, we're still doing tons of jazz, both from the Black Lion catalog, and then also we're working with uh, the GHB Jazz Foundation down in New Orleans, and they own a handful of uh, old, older catalogs, some of which are traditional New Orleans jazz, and uh, they also have some Paramount Blues and, and uh, just some great stuff in general. So we've been licensing from them over the years, licensing from Black Lion, uh, some Ooh. stuff from the majors, like I mentioned. Um, and then we're also working with some new jazz artists too, like uh, William Hooker. Uh, he's, you know, he's been around for a long time, but uh, we just put out a couple new records from him. Um, uh, we did, uh, we just did Phil, Phil Rainland's uh, last record. Um, he was, he was on a lot of the Fred, Freddie Hubbard sessions as a side man and started Tribe Records out of Detroit. So we, wow. we worked on a new album with him. Uh, I think we're going to do some reissues with him as well, but yeah, jazz is uh, not, you know, we, we're all over the place with genre, but jazz is definitely a, a big one for us. Yeah, that's where I started my career with. I did albums for Pharaoh's first album, Pharaoh Sanders. I worked on God of Barbieri and Bob James, myself. And I noticed the, the a lot of the jazz that you have crossed over into ESP, uh, not everything, but certain things. And it looked like a really great catalog. The other thing uh, 
is that Jeff Bowers, right? He founded the label originally. Is that the story? He was one, yeah, one of the founders, yeah. Yeah, and then he worked, he actually helped Michael Kurtz with the beginning of record store days. That's what I was reading about also. Um, it was very interesting. Uh, but your catalog goes into Sonic Youth, uh, a lot of incredible other artists. And what I really attracted me also was the packaging that, that you have consistently. You have some phenomenal packaging in album covers and disc art. And uh, that makes your label uh, a step above a lot of other labels in the continuity area of graphics. Uh, because, of course, being a, an album cover designer, I look, I look at that. And uh, it's a beautiful catalog, by the way. Um, uh, if people go on to Org Records, you can go on the Internet and uh, see the catalog of all your, all your work. I want to show some of the packaging. So... This is our friend Michael DeBarra's uh, Record Store Day released this album uh, originally on Swan Song, reissued by Org. Uh, I think it was a 2000 run I, I saw on that, uh, Andrew, a 2000 run on that. Um, but it's a reissue, and uh, I think it's a, Norman, a very famous Norman C photograph in the back, and it's Michael on the band. Uh, but you yeah, have a, that you one have a, that one we were just released this past record store day actually just this past uh, this past April. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that was a that's great, and and you're tied into record store day obviously, which is really great. Uh, right. This is this is another one. Oh my god, I love this. I saw the Discord on this. It was like really wild. I hate. Mean, uh, yeah, uh, that that side, the, the second side that you held up there, um, uh, not that one, but the, the the other one, the opposite one. Yeah, that that's an illustration by uh, a friend of the label, Micah Nelson. Um, uh, really, yeah, really killer painting. Um, and the, the flip side is the original cover art from that album. So that was part of the, the King Gizzard uh, bootlegger series, where they they put all these albums up and allowed labels to kind of do their own thing. So we. Uh, we did a few versions of that record, including that picture disc that you're holding, and I, I think it came out great. So here's the album. Yep. With the artwork that we're talking about, so everybody could see. Um, and uh, also, what I uh, what I really like is a little forte here. This is one reason why the disc art, man. This is flash art. I love this. I love this, Andrew. Yeah, yeah that's a splatter like record. I just want to say that's a splatter. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it goes with the artwork. You know, I mean, it's a real continuity thing going with the going with the artwork, you know, the color range also. You know. And here we go. Doc Hacker. Now, I love this album. It's such a simple cover and simplicity brings along good graphics. I always believe that. And it's almost like a Japanese painting or something. And then you get in there oh here we go again splatter another splatter yeah we don't we don't do a ton of splatter records so it's uh those are those are a few good examples there of ones that we've done and that uh that record uh is uh that was an anniversary i uh, i believe it was the i have to look back i believe it was the 10th anniversary pressing of that record but um oh, really? the uh yeah the uh the band Dot Hacker, um, they're not as active anymore, but uh, Josh Klinghoffer, the, the lead singer um, and one of the guitar players from that band, uh, we also work with him on his new project, Plural One. Um, and mm. they're, he's doing some great stuff with that and uh, he's actually out on the road with Pearl Jam uh, next. Oh, summer, really? Uh, wow, that's September. good to know. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm going to bring in... Da -da 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 -da. I love this cover. <laughs> I love the artwork. I mean, it's all... You know, the front and the back are even great. I love the back artwork. And I think, let me see as far as the rest of goes. Oh, yeah, here we go. This is a very subtle splatter color. Uh, yeah, that one's more of a swirl, like a color mix, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and this is really nice. I mean, it works really well, you know, with the whole package. Um, and even Yeah, that, one, uh, that band is actually... Um, uh, Mike and Nelson, who did the illustration I was just telling you about, King Gizzard, uh, he he sings he sings in that band as well. Oh really? Um, 
Yeah, and that was one we did with our friend Henhouse Studios, another label here in LA. Um, we we just did the vinyl version of that for them. These are That's really great cool. I mean, this is a good example of what you, what you bring out to the public in in, in the issuing of, of albums. This is another one. Um, Uz, Uzales, I guess. Hard to be uh, Uzels, Uzels. Uzel. Yeah, they're a, they're an LA based band here. Um, and uh, they're actually um, they're playing a, a release show for that album uh, a couple years late uh, uh, next or later this week um, here in LA because they uh, they put out the album and of course you know COVID happened um, so they didn't get to tour and support it but it's a great record um, we did uh, I think you've got the black vinyl version there but we yeah, also did a, vinyl, uh, yeah. Like, yeah. We also did like a, a cloudy, clear, like Coke bottle, uh, Coke bottle oh, really? green version of that. Yeah, wow. um, but it's a great, yeah, it's a great record. But you know, it's you no, know, it's interesting, Andrew, as you're, as you're describing the disc. Um, the black record even works with this because there's so much black in the art that yeah. it almost yeah. really, really works with that in that way, which is very uh, intriguing. It works as du- like a double, double fold type thing, you know, in that way. Yeah. You know? And the, the art, the, the designer on that one was um, David Orlando, uh, another friend. He's oh, also yes. the drummer in the band. Yeah. I like this one. This is really offbeat. I mean, I love the, I love the illustration and the concept of this. Um, no kidding. Yeah, that's a new one. Yeah, this is really cool. And, um, and then the disc, they get out of his sleeve. He has clear. Absolutely clear, and and that works really well with this cover because the cover is very simple, um, you know, with a with a very a lot of white in it, you know. So it yeah. really works well, we well. Yeah. we intentionally did the uh, the milky clear uh, color vinyl for uh, for Milk Jennings. So yeah. there you go. I like milky clear. I like that, and. Um, and then I want to bring up this artist. A, this guy is really incredible. Um, Zachary Kale, he's a uh, he's a New Yorker. Yeah, he um, that's a, also another record that just came out a few months ago. Um, he's actually playing playing Brooklyn next week, but he's he's got some great stuff in his catalog. That was our first record with him, um, but it's one of our one of my favorites of the newer artists that we're working with that's come out. Uh, he is. I heard this, this album is really good. I, I would suggest people to get this album. He's really a good singer. I love him. You know. Yeah, great songwriter too. Yeah. So I mean, you've got tons of stuff. I could I could easily ask you, but you're so nice enough to just send these over to me. But <laughs> there's so much stuff on that catalog that looked very intriguing. Look, plus you've got uh other historic uh, tell us about some of the other historic art you have johnny cash right you have jerry lee lewis tell us about some of the yeah. other artists sure yeah i mean we work with a handful of different catalogs um and it, you know johnny and jerry uh those those ones obviously come from the sun records catalog and we've done a lot with them over the years um both the kind of marquee artists like johnny and jerry lee lewis but also um some of the lesser known artists and we've done um uh, we're on our 10th year. April will be our 10th year of uh, Sun Records curated by Record Store Day compilations where the stores actually vote on a theme's track list um, that we then manufacture and put out for Record Store Day. So we've done a lot with them over the years, um, you know, everything from Charlie Feathers and Howlin' Wolf to uh, oh, the yeah. ad-libs and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, but yeah, Sun, Sun's a great catalog that we've had, you know, the privilege of working with for years now. Um, but there's also, you know, there's, there's plenty of others as well. Um, and we're, uh, we're always kind of forging new partnerships and, and opening up new doors in terms of uh, catalogs and, and records that haven't been released, um, including some stuff that, you know, wasn't known to begin with, like uh, Sly Stone's uh, first duo band of its gains. We uh, found the master tapes for, from that record that was never released and tracked wow. down some of the other original members. Um, so yeah, we've got you know everything from from doo-wop and and jazz to you know you know we do a lot of punk rock stuff. Uh, we work with Mike Watts and the Minutemen, and we've been doing all the, the Bad Brains uh, catalog reissues. Uh, so it's really you know genre-wise, it's all over the place, which is yeah, which think, is like my taste. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm that way too. I mean, my ear goes to everything, but when I saw you, such a diverse catalog of incredible stuff also, it's also the stuff that you choose that makes you a great label. You know, uh, you have a good quality uh, head trip mindset and that really, really yeah. makes the label. Uh, what is, uh, you're in that whole fold of the other, there are certain other labels like Third Man, Jack White's label and uh, Concord and other labels. You're all in this whole focus of, of a great support system with Record Store Day, right? I mean, vinyl was the impetus, right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, as you can read the book, I think uh, vinyl, uh, I think it surprised everyone that, you know, that vinyl became, you know, so immediately the focus of Record Store Day. Um, and it had a big that had a big part in rejuvenating vinyl for the stores themselves. Um, of course, there were plenty of artists um, in you know niche genres. You know, I, I don't think punk, punk rock artists never really stopped pressing vinyl. And you know, there's yeah. definitely that you know the house music and some electronic music um, that never really you know through the through the CD boom they never really stopped. But yeah, it came, in a big way, it came back. Um, you know, you know partially due to record store day for sure. Um, but just, I think there was a huge vinyl resurgence in the in the early part of the 2000s, and uh, it's it's only gotten bigger every year. Yeah, I had a book out called uh, 45 RPM in 2002, and the book sold out of the box. Larry wrote a nice review on it, and after that, we did another 45 book called 545s, and it, it was a vinyl thing. You know what you're talking about? In the early 2000s, it was starting to pick up. Uh, and now I, I just got, I got Billboard, uh, being a, a NARAS member, I got a Billboard issue and I had a whole one page on vinyl. It was very interesting. And they were talking about how vinyl just boosts the number one artist up to uh, number one. <laughs> you might say like yeah. McCart McCartney and Lady Gaga, they, they just bolstered so much vinyl production on their albums. And yeah, just, well, and, yeah, yeah, and you know, vinyl I did CDs uh, last year, which is pretty incredible. So yeah, um, def definitely moving in the right direction. And uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, unfor fortunately, it's moving in the right direction in terms of demand. Unfortunately, uh, you know, I don't think that the vinyl manufacturing world was necessarily prepared to to handle that boom. So we that's why we're seeing a lot of new pressing plants come online now, and capacity is trying to catch up to demand, but. I mean, it's a, it's a great problem. I want to ask to you, Andrew, being the owner of a label, right? I know there's a lot associated with in the background that a lot of people don't know. But with the demand now for vinyl, how do you find that your costs fluctuate? Do you find like during the year you have times when your costs are up and then your costs might be a little bit less, but then they go up again? How does it work with the costings to make the actual vinyl complete album? Well, it's, it's only gone up in recent years, um, especially since COVID. I mean, between, like every other industry, uh, labor labor has gone up, freight freight and shipping have gone up, um, you know, cost of jackets, cost of raw materials for vinyl have gone up, so the pressing plants have to charge more, the mastering engineers have to charge more to cut lacquers because those materials cost more. So it's really, uh, you know, it's really snowballed. Um, unfortunately, but you know, especially over the last couple of years, um, it's just it. We've seen it go. You know, the prices have gone through the roof. Um, well, at least costs have gone through the roof. We try to keep our pricing as steady as we can, but of course, you know, we have to make uh, we have to keep the lights on and make enough margins to uh, to make it work. But uh, yeah, it's. Um, we're not really seeing any dips these days, <laughs> I guess. That's great. Uh, now, Andrew, I just want to ask you this. If you do an artist and he's signed to your label and you do an album with the artist, can you tell me how many sales do you normally have to do to break even on an album, like a 14-track album, for example? You know, it's really case by case because some artists, uh, you know, some artists we go into it knowing that we're going to do a, a limited pressing. Um, some artists we have, uh, you know, we're also working with them on on digital and uh, you know and other formats, or there might be you know sync sync rights uh, in the equation. So it's it's really hard to say what numbers break even uh, without you know without knowing all the all the bits and pieces because every record is so different. Um, but you know, typically um, if we're doing you know if we're doing just a one-off 
vinyl only record and it's a pretty standard package, you know, we're still going to need to sell through, you know, in most cases, sell through at least half, if not three quarters of the pressing before we start getting into, into profits. So um, it's a, it's, you know, high cost, low margin <laughs> uh, industry, the, the vinyl thing. And, uh, you know, again, that's, that's not the case for all the releases and, and some of them, uh, you know, we can lean a little bit more heavily on digital and, and other revenue streams, but um, it, yeah, it is, it is very high, uh, high front, uh, upfront costs. Now the thing is, I know that you do 45s also. I was very interested in that. Um, uh, I didn't have anything to show here, but you do some really cool 45s, right? Right, Andrew? Yeah, we, we've done a we've done a, a good amount of them. Uh, you know, they are they're not not the you know in a lot of ways I see them more as a promotional item than I do uh, you know a revenue stream for the label yeah. because they. They they still cost quite a bit to make. Um, people aren't uh, willing to pay <laughs> too much for two songs, <laughs> for, uh, understandably, right? So, right, right. Um, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, it's a merch item. I mean, I, I see the stores also kind of gravitating away from them unless it's you know the right release. Um, but you know, we still do them, and uh, it's still I, I like I like the format. Um, you know, it's uh, it's great for DJs uh, going out to just spin one track or flip, flip it to the B side. Um, it's, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, being a profitable item for the business, it's, it's not, not something we're necessarily chasing often. It's, it's more of a value add or something to help yeah, promote yeah. an upcoming release. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, a, I'm an avid 45 collector for years and I go all over the world and buy things. And it's so amazing the popularity of it, you know, in a sense also, uh, what is your minimum run? Do you have a minimum run for albums? You know, um, typically we don't do any. Most of our records are at least a thousand. Um, there are some cases where we'll we'll go as low as five hundred, but we're not doing anything below five hundred on vinyl. Right. Um, it's just when, you know, not only the vinyl, but when you when you get get to the print costs for jackets and other things um, at, at less than five hundred uh, pieces, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, unfortunately. And, and do you? Uh... Are you doing your manufacturing here in the United States, or do you go out to other countries, or you know? Uh, both, both. We do uh, we do a lot of manufacturing at uh, Furnace Record Pressing in Virginia. Um, oh, really good. And, I use um, them. Oh, they're great. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Yeah, we do we do a whole lot with them. Uh, we're doing uh, a good. We were doing a good amount with uh, Palace in Germany, um, who has you know they press great records. Um, unfortunately, you know costs costs are an issue right now with them because. Uh, you know, they, they were getting their nickel from Ukraine for one, so that, that you know, right. <laughs> like it. yeah, and then, yeah. uh, you know, just pressing overseas gets expensive, but yeah, we press there, uh, occasionally we press at GZ in the Czech Republic, especially our seven inches, we do a lot of those at GZ, um, in Czech Republic, um, mm -hmm. through a company called Pirates Press, uh, here in mm -hmm. the States, they're the broker for them, uh, but yeah, you know, um, we, we press, we pressed at record industry, we pressed at, um, plant called Kindercore in Athens, Georgia. We pressed um, uh, Rainbow when they were around. We pressed, you know, we pressed at lots of different plants, um, but most of our business now is uh, is, is at Furnace uh, in Virginia. Just they've, they've got the capacity for us, and um, they I, I think that they make a really great quality record, uh, especially for the money. I was going to back you up. I've used Furnace before. They've been around for years. They're wonderful, absolutely great quality. Uh, company totally yeah yeah um and we uh i think we'll we'll continue probably doing doing a lot with them um and and uh them gz and palace are the three that i think we have jobs open at right now but there are a lot of great plants out there and there's more opening up and i wish all of them the best of luck because we we all as an industry we need uh more capacity um yes to, to, definitely to meet this demand. get those and presses I, yeah. rolling and I know it's not. I know it's not easy, and it's not cheap for those plants. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't disparage any of them. I think um, you know everyone's out there trying to make uh, make great records and and uh, do it do it the best they can. What is what is the timetable now on the average uh, to put a record out? It really you know it really depends on where you go and and uh, you know and how long you've been doing business with them to some degree. I know that some plants are turning away new customers entirely just because they don't have, um, they don't have the capacity. 
Um, you know, I'm hearing I'm hearing over a year at some plants. Um, you know, uh, we're getting quoted five to six months at others, and then uh, at Furnace we do have some reserve capacity monthly um, because we've been a long time customer of theirs, and uh, so we 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 see a little bit quicker turns there. Um, but it, yeah, it's yeah, it's not like it used to be even a few years ago. Um, everything's definitely gotten a lot longer lead in terms of turn times, which is tough because you have to really be able to anticipate demand. Um, you have to be, uh, you know, you have to be a little bit flexible if there's delays in the process because mm -hmm. because of all, all the issues we've seen recently, whether it's shortages of raw materials, shortages of labor, uh, people are uh, people are making do, but it's it's a tough time out there. Yeah, I gotta How say, Andrew, I just gotta say this. Isn't it amazing, Andrew? At one point, the record companies, right, sold off their plants, their pressing plants, because they thought vinyl was dying. And then everybody who was smart bought the plants, waited, and then the big vinyl revival came back so strong that now they can't stop. The, the industry is just blown up so much that they can't keep up with demand. Does that blow you away that vinyl doesn't die? How strong a format it is? Yeah. I mean, it's great. It's great. I mean, you know, it has a lot of things working against it, and it's great to see that it's continued year over year to get, to get bigger and bigger. Um, you know, my uh, my one worry, and I think um, I, I know I'm not the only person to share this concern, is that uh, we well, one, we can't meet demand, and two, um, you know, it's not uh, not particularly environmentally friendly product vinyl. So um, I I know that there's a lot of good people working on uh, solutions that are alternatives to PVC or ways to make vinyl that um, you know that uh, where, where they're not having as big of an impact on the environment and mm. and you know with with the amount of records being pressed and the amount of new plants coming online i think that gets more and more important by the day there is a friendly isn't there uh i remember years ago i would do the interview me about cd packaging and i get away from plastic i go to board and I talk about uh but the, at, the, at that time uh, they were they're actually printing inks that were environmentally friendly is that in the view of, of printing inks you know what I'm saying you know I don't know about much about the printing inks um, I do know that um, you know the vast majority of our packages CD packages are are uh, cardboard now rather than uh, rather than right. plastic yeah right um, and uh, you know I think that that's that was a great step. Um, I think, you know, vinyl, obviously the disc itself is, is made of PVC. So right. uh, you've got, you got, you got, you got bigger issues, but, um, you know, I think, um, I, 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 I'm encouraged. I just got back from a conference, uh, where, uh, you know, there was a lot of people talking about, uh, ways to make it more sustainable and, and, uh, the efforts that are going into that. So I'm encouraged by it. I think, it, like I said, I think it, it will become more and more important as time goes on and, and we're seeing more and more pressing plants come online. Well, yeah, I mean, what we're talking about the board area, especially because even with CD board, you have environmentally friendly paper board and, and with vinyl, you have the same thing, right? So that's a really good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can do, you know, there's, there's people out there that are offering recycled board um, you know, a lot of plants are recycling. There's, uh, you know, regrinding their PVC. Um, so there, you know, there there are steps that are being taken, certainly. But um, you know, I think it's it's like like most industries. Um, there's a long way to go. Uh, I like the uh, going into disc art. You have a lot of different variances. I love that whole area of disc art. Now it's very it used to be just a black record. Now it's color. Now it's splattering. It's all these different effects. Uh, how is the prices of that compared to, uh, say, a splattering record, uh, that type of art, as compared to a black record? What is the price range difference? Is there much or not? Uh, it's, it's significant. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to quote you the exact amount because it depends right. on the plant you're, press your plant you're pressing out, the quantity you're pressing, and the number of colors you're using. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, a single color record is, quite a bit more expensive than a black black vinyl um a slider record is, is even more expensive than that uh the pi picture discs of course are even more so yeah right. uh, the more fancy you get with with the disc itself uh the more it's going to cost but you know we have found that that 
um, fans are, are willing to pay for that difference too. So, you know, typically we do charge uh, a small increase for color vinyl and uh, even more for the, the splatter variants. Yeah, I'm excited as a designer and art director, and I judge the Grammys and making vinyl event every year. I'm very honored to do that. To see that the entries in these events are amazing. I mean, the they really go out and do the production the right way in the graphics. And uh, yeah. that's so hard for, for a designer like me. It's so wonderful to see. You know, I always worried about the cost factor in my life. I said, is this going to change? Is it going to be cheaper? You know, it's like when they when they originally I was doing uh, vinyl years ago, they took away the inner sleeve and they took away everything and they took away all your options. Now it's the reverse. We're getting back to like the 70s, the Led right. Zeppelin die cut windows and the board and die cut boards. It's so wonderful, you know, right? So you're in that you're on record labels in that area, you know? Oh, yeah, certainly. And I mean, we we've done we've done some pretty, pretty cool packages as far you know as far as box sets go and things like that but yeah uh, yeah i mean all of those things now are especially are, are taking a lot longer to do any kind of uh especially if you're talking about special you know special packaging from you know die cuts and things to the board itself yeah. um you know it's it's great you know i love to see it and i i love my you know i as a vinyl collector and fan you know i i, I like having that stuff myself so i can see the appeal well uh my heart goes out to you as a designer and a vinyl head myself and i just want to tell you it's so wonderful that your label is existing for me and it makes makes i think everybody happy out there to see that and especially you're such a big vinyl backer and that's a big thing with me also and what what is go is there anything coming up any new albums coming up or anything you want to talk about with your label Sure. Yeah, we've got a lot of stuff coming up in the pipeline here. Um, we've got a few things planned for Black Friday record start in November, which not allowed to say what those are yet. Um, but we've got some. Uh, we're actually finally getting some of our stock back on a lot of our jazz vinyl that was pressed in Germany. It's taken a while to get. Um, we've got um, Flora Wan, who I mentioned, is, is the same uh, singer from that band, Dot Hacker. Uh, his new album is coming out on vinyl um, in a few weeks here. Um, we've got, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at my list over here. We just, uh, we just released a new band out of LA called Color Green. It's great. Their record came out a couple weeks ago. Oh, wow. Um, we're, yeah, continuing with our Bad Brains reissue series. So we'll have, uh, have some new color variants rolling out on that. And then also some, uh, uh the next record in the series coming out probably by the end of the year. So, um, there's, there's loads of stuff I couldn't, eat. I can't even name it all just because there's, <laughs> It's a busy release schedule. Less, um, that's but, such a, yeah. yeah, that's exciting. I like to hear yeah. that. We're very excited about that. Uh, Plastic, do you want to add anything? You want to ask any questions? I just want to say now, the show is very tight. The show is great. As I said, Andrew came on small. We're going to end on a high. I just want to ask Andrew about all his links, if that's all right, Spencer. And if you want to wrap it, wrap it. Because I think it at 30 five minutes it's a really tight interview so you don't want to let it drag on because then yeah. you lose interest so i'll just ask andrew about the links now andrew okay. i just want to show now andrew i just want to say it's really great having you on the show right because we've got so many people that are collectors and now they know about your label it's really fantastic can you just tell everyone though all your links about where they can read about all your new releases and more about the company Sure thing. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me aboard. It's been been great to talk with you both. And uh, yeah, you can find us at orgmusic.com, orgmusic.com. Uh, you can find us on uh, Twitter, uh, on Facebook, on Instagram, um, any any of those places. And um, yeah, you can find our records in your local record store, just just about anywhere. So yeah, keep an eye out. And I want to thank you. Uh, from the both of us, uh, Andrew, and it's wonderful to have you on. And it's a good, it's a good uh, educational program for people to learn about the vinyl, your vinyl label. All right, thanks, Spencer. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, sure. We love thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. All the best. I hope so. Yeah. Take care. Take care. Vinyl. <laughs>